at the high level, when we think of heat or mass transfer, we need to think about the flux equation. There's this general equation that applies time and again to everything we're going to be doing. And that is this rule that tells us that flux is equivalent to some kind of coefficient, which I'll just abbreviate, times some driving force. And so without looking at any numbers or any Greek letters, uh, this is all it's telling us is that we've got some flux is equal to this coefficient times a driving force. And now as we begin to depict these terms, what we're going to know is that flux is equivalent to a quantity per area per time. And then this coefficient is generally something that's in a form of like a k or some some literally just a con constant or a coefficient that depends on some other factors and then this driving force is usually some kind of difference between two things or a differential and so when we take this kind of template breadboard and look at the heat transfer equation that we may have learned in high school chemistry or physics class, usually what you'll see people write is this stuff where you've got, you know, Q dot is equivalent to K times A times delta T or something like this. And as you introduce differentials into these equations, uh, we look at the DT, this kind of temperature gradient. And so this flux, if we look at this equation here, is really just dividing both sides of this equation by area. So flux here corresponds to this Q dot over A term. And I'm sorry, my uh, computer's acting up a little bit, but you get the point. So flux is equal to this coefficient times this driving force. And specifically this heat flux is equivalent to this coefficient of heat transfer times a difference and temperature, some kind of temperature gradient. And what we also remember from the uh, fundamental laws of thermo is that heat is transferred from hot objects to cold objects. So we know the directionality of this heat transfer. So very important to remember that heat moves from hot to cold objects. And we can say something very similar to things regarding mass transfer. And when we look at mass transfer, we'll say that mass moves from high to low concentrations. So if I took a ball pit of many different colored balls, uh, just like we used to have at Chuck E. Cheese, and we had all these red balls stuck in the corner. That's an area of high concentration, and what do I expect to happen over time is we have mass transfer occurring in my ball pit, is I expect to see a bunch of my red balls eventually diffuse through the ball pit, and then they'll be widely distributed everywhere. Just the same thing can be said with heat, or this energy. It's that energy doesn't like to be jammed up in this one spot. It wants to kind of diffuse through systems, and if we ask ourselves, the big question here, <laughs> why? Why is because it's how we maximize entropy. How do we give something the most degrees of freedom it can possibly have in our closed system? And so um, this is the very important conceptual overview of everything that we're going to be discussing in heat and mass transfer classes as engineers and scientists. Now, the next thing we're going to be looking at is the units that we're going to be using or the dimensions that are going to be in all of our equations. And so when we talk about a rate of heat transfer, like how many joules per second of something are moving through an object, uh, we usually define the term watts. So W, I'll just write it out, watts, one watt is equal to one joule per second. So it's a rate of energy. How much energy have I just transferred in this given time period is equivalent to one watt. And so commonly when we're talking about a heat flux, 
which will put a little hat on top of our Q, just so we know that Q, Q hat, which is really equivalent to this Q dot over area, this heat flux is equal to Q dot, which Q dot is just gonna have units of watts per area. So if we look at the dimensions on this equation, we'll have watts per, and we can go with like meters squared for area, will be equal to some coefficient of heat transfer. And man, my computer sucks today. <laughs> anyway, um, some kind of coefficient of heat transfer, which I'll just leave it as K for now. And we'll keep these dimensions the same. And we can actually do a dimensional analysis to determine what uh, K is. So it's gonna be equal to some coefficient times a difference in temperature. This difference in temperature will have units of uh, something like degrees Celsius or degrees Kelvin, for instance, and I'll go with degrees C just so that I am uh, sticking to uh, not having too many Ks present. So um, this thing here will have units of times, you know, degrees C. So you'd have like zero and 100 degrees Celsius would be this difference in temperature that is causing a movement of energy in your system. And so if we wanted to do a dimensional analysis and say like, okay, tell me what are the units of uh, K in this equation, it's literally just rearranging it. K, your coefficient of heat transfer is gonna have units of watts per meter squared per degree Celsius. And so these are gonna have a lot of different uh, dimensions to them, depending on what units you're doing within your specific problem statement. And so when we look at something like mass transfer, I'm gonna to try to keep this video short too, by the way, but when we look at units of mass, mass transfer, well, what do we measure mass in? We measure mass usually in stuff like kilograms or kilomoles, um, so we've got kilograms and we're caring about some rates, so this would be a kilogram of something moved per second, for instance, would be equivalent to what is our heat flux, or I'm sorry, our mass flux, and then we're gonna be dividing this whole thing by the, an area, so we'd say, you know, how many kilograms per second are moving through this material in one square meter of space, for instance. And so um, this would be the left side of our general flux equation, and on the right side, we're gonna have, again, some kind of coefficient of mass transfer, which I'll again just say, let's call it K sub M, K sub M times, and then a driving force for this mass transfer. And this driving force is gonna have units of concentration differences. So how many you know, kilograms per uh, given volume are we gonna have of something that is resulting in this uh, mass exchange? And so if we begin to think about, well, what is units of concentration? Uh, as we were saying, this is usually equivalent to, you know, we can think of stuff in terms of like moles per uh, something. So I'd say like kilomoles per cubic meter. And then if we do some kind of uh, dimensional analysis on this, and for the sake of uh, simplicity, I will keep things in units of kilograms per cubic meter. So it's amount of stuff per a given volume. And if we were to now do a dimensional analysis on what is K sub M, uh, K sub M would be equivalent to the following. So we would have kilograms per second per square meter. And we would multiply this by the reciprocal. We would have kilograms per cubic meter. So the dimensions on the uh, following here would be meters per second, which is actually equivalent to velocity, which is very interesting. But anyway, so these are the dimensions we're gonna be working with in our mass and heat transfer equations. And these are the core concepts that we should just get right from the start. And then um, to give an example problem of something that, uh, you know, I think all of us can relate to, if we think about the following in which we are sweating, I think it's an excellent example of something that shows how connected rates of heat and mass transfer are to one another. And uh, to set up some kind of example problem that can be food for thought, let's say that the human body has an area of two square meters. So you've got two square meters of exposed skin. And when we are sweating, what's happening to the sweat? So if I was to take a section of 
skin, exposed skin, and we've got this sweat right here on the surface. I'll just label this skin and sweat. And we think about what is the objective of sweating. Um, it's to cool us down, right? So the objective here is to cool down the body as soon as possible because um, you're really hot. And what is happening here is when we think about the two things that are happening with the sweat is number one, we are changing the thermal properties of our skin by having this fluid on its surface. It's making this fluid much more conductive uh, and, or it's making this surface a lot more conductive, which is allowing a lot more heat to go from your body to the outside world, assuming that, you know, if you had T sub B and T sub A, where T sub B was greater than T sub A, which is generally the case because your body temperature is 98.6, outside temperature is probably 70 degrees C, or I'm sorry, 70 degrees F, uh, you're going to have temperature flowing, uh, you're going to have heat flowing in the direction from your body to the outside world. So this would be Q sub dot right there. And so um, the two equations here to think about would be in terms of this heat transfer that is occurring at this moment in time, we can say that Q dot will be equivalent to some kind of coefficient of heat transfer, which I'll just call K. And then um, this will be Q dot per area. By the way, just we stick to what we were talking about earlier. This is equivalent to K times this difference in temperature, uh, which would be T sub B minus T sub A. And negative signs here are pretty important. Um, so you're gonna wanna just make sure that you've defined what is the direction and then assign a sign to that specific direction. But yeah, so that is what this would look like. And if we think about, well, in terms of a mass transfer equation, what's happening? is your sweat, which we can simplify in this example as just water, uh, this sweat is evaporating. It's changing phase into, uh, it's leaving the liquid phase and entering the vapor phase, which would be the air in this example. So we've got a liquid phase right here, a vapor phase in the air, and over time as your sweat evaporates, it is, evapor um, it is gonna be grabbing energy from its surroundings in the process of doing this mass transfer into a different phase and the result of that is going to be some kind of uh, heat loss from the surroundings and so this is the reason why your sweat is so powerful is it's not just helping you cool down by increasing the coefficient of heat transfer between your skin and the outside world but it's also going to be grabbing energy so that the molecules or the little atoms of liquid that are in the liquid phase are going to be getting enough thermal energy to be excited and leave into the vapor phase. And so that's the other big thing that's happening here. Um, so in that regard, what we can think about is the heat of vaporization. And this has units of kilojoules per kilogram. So how many kilojoules of energy do we need to put into a kilogram of something to make it change phase from a liquid to a vapor? And for water at 18 degrees C, this is equivalent to 2,458 kilojoules per kilogram, which is a lot of energy per kilogram of water. So if you sweated one liter of water, which is one kilogram, that one liter of water is gonna be taking with it 2,458 kilojoules of energy from the surroundings in order to be evaporated. And so this is a lot of energy that your body is having taken away from it in order to help you cool down, which is also accomplishing this goal here of why do we sweat? And so um, as a conceptual example, uh, this is what's happening. And so in terms of thinking about the relationship between these two, because I think when you're presented with this stuff as an undergrad, you know, you're going to be talking about heat transfer and then you're going to be talking about mass transfer and you know, there are these parallels between the two, but there's also this very beautiful relationship, which is, you know, as we have this mass transfer occurring, we're also gonna be affecting the rates of heat transfer because there's gonna be less water to be changing this coefficient of heat transfer. And there's also going to be, um, you know, as there's more heat transfer, 
uh, the rates of mass transfer are also going to be changing too. So there's this dependence on both temperature and concentration differences that are the reasons why we have to rely so much on these partial differential equations to accurately model our systems. So um, a lot of food for thought. Uh, I thought I'd just present this as an introduction to heat and mass transfer um, and hope you guys enjoy it. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you all for watching. And especially during these COVID times, please stay safe, wash your hands, wear masks, and be safe. And I'll talk to you next time.